you just keep doing experiment over and over again and you keep getting the same answer, you know, that's good, you're reproducible. Um, but at some point, you're not learning anything new in that experimental design. And my thesis advisor, David Botstein, used to say that's taking rigor and making it rigor into rigor mortis, right? And so uh, it's a really good statement, right? I mean, at some point, it's, a, it's diminishing returns. So one way to, as experimental design is, is to certainly design experiments which test ideas by different approaches. So, you know, you can do an experiment a thousand times and optimize that experiment. But unless you find a different way to validate that, that experiment, I don't think it can ever really be, con you can do, really, it can never be as convincing as if you find a different way to address that same question. For example, let's say you had three different types of experiments. If you had three experiments all giving you the same answer versus 800 trials of a single experiment, I can tell you which one I think is more convincing. And it's going to be like three independent trials. So the nice thing with orthogonal approaches is when they align with one another and you test in your experiment what the outcome was and you have two completely different ways of gauging success, that's comforting. I don't know any other way to phrase it other than I would like to know that that experiment was designed to get an answer and if I test the answer to that question in two different ways and get basically the same confirmation, to me that suggests that it was a successful experiment. I think the other thing that's incredibly powerful about orthogonal approaches is, is that one, it allows you to potentially include different controls because of the nature of the experiment so that you can feel much more comfortable about the conclusions you're drawing and the caveats you're addressing. And two, it also has the opportunity to potentially reveal new biology. Because you're doing an experiment in a slightly different way, there are things that could buttress your initial results, but also provide new information that tells you that you should be actually going in a different direction as well. So when we are discussing that tension between um, doing enough experiments to draw confident cl conclusions versus the amount of time that it takes to do that many experiments. Ultimately, you have to be comfortable with the conclusion you're drawing. Really good exercise for a lot of people is to go back and read the famous Hershey Chase experiments, which supposedly show that DNA was the hereditary material. So the way the experiment is done is you made viruses that had S35 labeled proteins and P32 labeled DNA and you absorb the virus to the cells, and if it's the protein that's the genetic material, you'll see the S35 has to go inside the cell, and if it's the DNA, it'll be the phosphorylation, the phosphorylated signal will go inside. And so it's reported out that they did the experiment, and the S35 stuck on the outside, so the protein stayed outside, and the phosphorylation went in, so it's the DNA went in. If you look at that experiment, 70% of the phosphorylated DNA went in, or stayed with the thing, and 30% of the protein. So you say, how could you possibly make this conclusion that they show that DNA is hereditary material? They had this, how do you know it wasn't the 30% of the protein? So if you read the paper, that is one of six experiments that they do. Each experiment is slightly different in their approach. And so you can't make a model that makes protein be the DNA by all the other approaches. It, it, it's just a series of arguments of which the only one that fits all the five different puzzles is the DNA and not the protein. And it, it's really, it's a, it's a total misconception and misrepresentation in science that a single experiment is usually ever done that proves something. So, you know, looking to do an orthogonal approach that actually gives you the same test where they get the same answer is a much better sort of a way of thinking about experimental design. So orthogonal approach could be one of many strategies, but the idea is to come up with either an existing, uh, a different kind of experiment or a different kind of measurement. A certainly fair ortho orthogonal strategy would be using a different measurement technique. So essentially getting uh, a different kind of readout of your biological system so that whatever limitations there are about the technique you're using or the blind spots of a technique, you know, that could be overcome by uh, a a different technique that has different strengths and weaknesses. What you really want to do is, is evaluate what are the, the pros and cons of each different type of technique. And so um, it's not, there's never necessarily going to be one silver bullet that is going to give you the best answer using a single technique. So it's good to sort of keep in mind that you plan to have 
you know, sort of, uh, you know, multi-pronged effort. You want to have multiple ways of testing to see if something is true because you may want to take the strengths of one technique and the strengths of another technique and combine them. And if, the, if, if two different sort of ways of getting an answer can, can give, you the, give you the same result, that is something that is, is really, really powerful. Certainly any kind of different kind of experiment is also, I would consider, uh, an orthogonal approach. You know, basically a different experimental um, strategy either for perturbing the system in some way or a, another way of probing that process using um, a different kind of experimental strategy. And another orthogonal approach also may be to use a, a different system. You know, that could be, in this case, for example, a different organism. You know, if this phenomena that you're studying or idea that you have may be universal. It may not be limited to HeLa cells. You may find it in worms or you may find it in a different experimental organism. So I think the answer is probably all of those strategies are good. And um, the more that you can bring them into play in one, and trying to answer one biological question, probably the more convincing your study is going to be, um, the more people will see it as robust and also potentially applicable to uh, kind of many biological systems.